I'll just give you a little background of, of, of me and, and my family. Uh, I was born here in Macon, Georgia. Um, actually, I was born in uh, Pleasant Hill at the old St. Luke Hospital. Um, St. Luke Hospital, unfortunately, isn't here anymore, but uh, I was born there and uh, some of the older physicians, Dr. J.S. Williams, he spent a number of years in Pleasant Hill and uh, I believe he was the physician that delivered me at the St. Luke Hospital in Pleasant Hill. Uh, my family has been in business here since about 1883. Uh, we started a upholstering business uh, by my great grandfather and uh, basically his motive for doing that was that he wanted to provide an education opportunity for his children. So at that time there weren't that many opportunities uh, available to African Americans so he started his own business. And again it started in 1883 we were in the upholstering business till about 2000, 2001. So we haven't verified it but I would say we are we were probably the oldest uh, African-American, continuing African-American business in Georgia at one time. Um, I can remember growing up in Pre Pleasant Hill, my dad driving uh, to work every morning because we'd have to get out there and help push the truck off. Uh, my dad was a firm believer in getting the best price on everything. He would buy these trucks and uh, they would just basically have a whole bunch of plates in the dashboard. See, most kids don't know anything about that. Everything in those days was an option, even a heater. My dad bought a truck that didn't have a heater in it. And what he would do is when he knew the weather was going to change and it was going to ice up, he would take an old piece of canvas, because we were in the awning business also, and lay it across the windshield. So in the morning, he would go out and pull this piece of canvas off the windshield and then he'd round us up to push him off down the hill to get the truck cranked up and go to work. So I have all those memories of growing up in Pleasant Hill. Uh, I went to Ballot Hudson and of course Ballot Normal was the precursor school for Ballot Hudson. Ballot Hudson was actually the combination of Ballot Normal and Old Hudson High School which was on Monroe Street in Pleasant Hill. My dad went to Ballot Normal. Uh, he and his brother went to Ballot Normal. And uh, of course, Ballot Normal was an American Missionary Association school uh, that was started, I think, by the greatest organization in the United States in terms of African American folks, which was the American Missionary Association. So that's a little background about me and my family. Uh, what we're going to talk about a little bit today is Miss Ruth Hartley Mosley. Miss um, Mosley has made or did make enormous contributions to Macon Middle Georgia. Uh, we are in her home right now um, and her story is important because our young folks need to know these mentors. We, they need to know these mentors in order to be motivated to want to learn. I think that's where we are kind of missing uh, the educational strategic uh, plans in terms of what they really should be about. You gotta go upstream and figure out how you're gonna motivate our children to learn because that's the most important thing. And these kids have to be motivated by the third grade because we know that if they're not motivated by the third grade, they are pipelined to the prison. My little thesis is simply this. We've got to lay what I call obligation ancestral guilt on the shoulders of our kids. They've got to know the struggles, the hardship, and the danger that their ancestors went through. Now, Ruth Hartley Mosley, she was born in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, she was born about, let me see, 
September 23rd, about 1886. And she died August of uh, 1975, I believe. Her father was an artisan. See, many of these, uh, many of our ancestors who were leaders in the day, they were artisans as well as having leadership roles. For example, many of the preachers were carpenters. Okay, and we've kind of lost that connection between having a pragmatic skill and having an academic skill. And I think we really need to kind of return to that. But the interesting thing about her lifespan is that her entire life spanned what was called the Jim Crow era of about 1876 to about 1965. And of course, Kids today don't even know what the Jim Crow era was. The Jim Crow era was basically the era of segregation throughout the South, mandated segregation. Now, um, she, she went to Beach Institute in Savannah, Georgia. Beach Institute, again, was an American Missionary Association school. Uh, it got funding from Alfred Eli Beach, who was uh, the editor of the Scientific American. Um, after finishing high school, she went on to college at Barbara Scotia uh, College in Concord, North Carolina. Okay, that was a Presbyterian sponsored school. And then later on, she got her nursing training at uh, Chicago Providence Hospital, okay? She came back to Macon. And the interesting thing about her is it would have been very easy for her to have decided to leave the South and just go North, as many did in that era, okay? because this era I learned in high school was called the Nadar area, the low point area. Now what is that? There's a book called Without Sanctionary that shows photo photographs of all the lynchings throughout the South. So for a person to decide and come back South at that time, when in many, many ways she could have assimilated up north, I think is very impressive. But anyway, around 1910, um, she had come back to uh, Georgia and she had managed to get hired down at Central State Hospital over in Milledgeville, which by the way, after the fall of Richmond, I believe, was the Confederate capital of Georgia during the Civil War. But anyway, she got a job down there and she became the first head of a department. It was called the Colored Nursing Department down there uh, at Central State Hospital at that time. Around 1917, she married uh, Richard Hartley. Now, this is an interesting situation. See, if you want to teach African-American kids their history, you need to talk about people in the community that lived in the era that you're talking about. Now, Richard uh, Hartley, he was a saloon owner or saloon keeper. And this was around 1917 that they got married. Well, now, if you want to talk about prohibition, then you need to talk about his circumstance at that time. Now, prohibition was coming, so they needed to shop around and see what they could get into to have a, a decent living at that time. Uh, so, anyway, uh, she decided and he decided to go into the funeral home business. Now, some kids today might say, well, you know, a lot of folks made money back in the prohibition times in those speakeasies and so forth, because we see that on TV, okay? 
Well, what we got to teach our kids was simply this. An African American getting caught selling moonshine in the South was not going to have an easy time in the prison system in the South. So that really wasn't a reasonable opportunity uh, for anyone to look into uh, and expect a positive outcome. So anyway, they got married, and around 1918, they uh, uh, went into the funeral home business, and around that time, they started Central City Funeral Home. Now, she went on to uh, be one of the first, I don't think she was absolutely the first, but she was one of the first uh, African-American uh, women, if not the first African-American woman, but one of the first women to get a mortician's license in that time. And she became very successful uh, in, in the uh, funeral home business. In fact, she dominated the uh, the funeral business at Macon at that time. Now, later on, uh, her husband dies, and I believe it's around 1937, uh, she marries Fisher Mosley. Now, I believe he was from Cochrane, Georgia, and um, he was a mail clerk on the railroad. By today's standards, I think a lot of kids wouldn't consider that a great job, but in that day, it was a wonderful job for uh, an African-American to have. Uh, it was a steady job, it had benefits and so forth, and a pension and so forth. So anyway, they got married, and she then, around 1938 or so, began her Bibb County public health nursing career. Okay, and that's where many of us uh, today remember her in her role as a public health nurse because um, Macon was losing. At one time, Macon had a lot of physicians and a lot of dentists, but they were losing, uh, the town was losing uh, physicians and, and dentists and so forth. They were moving north. But anyway, as her role as a public health nurse, she was the spokesman for the African-American community here in Macon, Georgia. Uh, I have uh, some video of the late uh, Dr. Robert Williams talking about her role at that time. She was the Hutton Speaks of that era. When she spoke, everybody listened. You have to remember at that time, um, probably one of the best jobs an African-American or colored person could have was being a domestic. And to have someone who had a home like this and who drove expensive uh, cars, Cadillac cars and so forth, was very, very unusual. Um, she was one of the founding members of the Booker T. Washington Center, which is located in Pleasant Hill. The Booker T. Washington Center is actually on the site where the old Hudson High School was, okay? But she uh, was part of the founding members, and you have to remember uh, uh, this was part of what was called the uh, Interracial Council. Uh, and the wonderful thing, see the wonderful thing about Macon is this, and I think this has been our saving grace, and I think we really need to go back and take a look at our history again. The great thing about Macon is we've always had a few good men, and I should say good women, okay? We've always had a small core of progressive people. And um, these people were able to come together and work through that interracial council to get the uh, uh, WPA, you know, uh, uh, Roosevelt's program and so forth, to sponsor along with the community chess, the Booker T. Washington Center. 
Now, I think it actually started down um, on Broadway, and I think at one time it may have been up on Cotton Avenue, and then eventually it uh, moved to Pleasant Hill and so forth. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Sheftall was the director, and growing up, I remember going to the Booker T. Washington uh, Center, um, and uh, he was the director, and he was one of those folks that knew how to pull this community together. Um, Dr. Andrew uh, Manis has written a book that I think everybody should read. It's called Making Black and White, The Unutterable Separation. But to me growing up, what I realized is that we also had this unutterable unity. Uh, we had this unutterable righteousness among a few good people, okay? And that to me has been what has uh, been our saving grace in terms of how uh, Macon has managed over the years not to have a whole lot of the other massive problems that we saw during the 60s. Now, Miss, uh, Miss Mosley was uh, a business leader. She was a socialite. And she was known really all over the United States uh, for playing bridge. And we have, yes, we have pictures of her uh, uh, and, and her bridge club. Uh, that she was a member of. I think the name of it was the As You Like It Bridge Club. Again, let's think of this in the context of the day, you know. The best job a person could have, you know, was, um, uh, for a female, was, was being a domestic, a maid and so forth. But here Miss Mosley is going all over the United States and traveling uh, you know, two different bridge clubs. Um, she did extensive travel. She had extensive real estate in Macon. And then when she passed uh, around 1975 in her will, she left her house and funding to support this facility for uh, community work and for helping to fund uh, African-American, uh, I was going to say women, but really nursing students. Um, and so as I reflect back on, on her, um, the thing to me that really rings a bell and resonates with me is this. She didn't join that great migration to the North. She could have very easily have done that. She had what I call a purposeful life. And she inspired others as well as herself to give something back to the community. She is recognized in Georgia Women's of Achievement. You can go to that website and you'll find her there. So Summing it up, I say simply that, uh, the, I'll say some, simply this about her. The people, her people in Georgia were always on her mind, okay? And um, she had uh, Georgia in her heart. And I think she's a wonderful inspiration for the generation of kids today to study her, but also use her as an instrument to learn our African-American history. Because our African-American history is not just for African-Americans, it's for everyone in the community. Thank you. Now I'm going to ask him some questions. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Okay. And you know what? You could use this. We could, especially at the Ruth Mosley Center, mm -hmm. that, that could be taken out totally 
so you could use it as yes. Beer. Is that okay? Mm, right, that's right. that's okay. what so I hate. Right, but but I yeah. know that. But I, I just but I like it for the Pleasant Hill history too, right. which you're right. Um, I'm going to go back and ask Dr. Duvall some questions because I need it. I need quotes from him. I know the quotes I want. He has them in his head. <laughs> I'm just going to make them say. Okay? <laughs> Are you good? Yes, we're ready. And Lorana, you can yell at that. We'll we'll do them. Boom, boom. You and I have talked, and mm -hmm. I think you have actually opened up to me the importance of the American Missionary Association and yes. understanding Pleasant Hills history and maybe African American history in total after the Civil War. Yes. And um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you see uh, how their work unfolded here in Macon and how important they are to under that understanding. I think the history of the American Missionary Association, in my mind, is the greatest story that's never really been told. At least it has not been told to a broad audience of African Americans and non-African Americans. I think it's one of the greatest stories that simply has not been told. After the Civil War, and even during the Civil War, <clears throat> the American Missionary Association was responsible for uh, the education and um, really food, clothing, and shelter for the slaves that came into the Union lines. And this is a term that we really have not embraced, but we really need to know it. They were accepted as contraband of war. Now, what does that mean? Ginger, uh, General Benjamin Butler up in, um, up in uh, Hampton, uh, Virginia area. Basically, uh, what happened was they had their battle, and then the Confederate general came in with a truce, of, a white uh, flag of, you know, of truce to uh, negotiate the situation because the slaves had run away. And he said, well, I want to get my slaves back. And heretofore, in most circumstances, the generals had sent the slaves back. But Benjamin Butler said, <clears throat> wait a minute now, uh, I'm not going to send the slaves back because they are contraband of war. And so the general said, well, wait a minute now, under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, you're supposed to give me my slaves back because that was the circumstance of the whole nation. Uh, that was the problem that Ellen Craft had uh, when she finally got north and then uh, that fugitive slave law came along. It didn't make her safe even in the north. And then there was Canada, and the truth be known, they, the, 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 these, these folks would come up to Canada and bring you back. But anyway, he said, no, they are contraband of war. And this general said, well, you're supposed to give them back. He said, well... <laughs> You are in conflict with her. You are like a foreign nation fighting us, so we don't have to honor that, so we're not going to send them back. That became the premise of accepting slaves throughout the entire United States as contraband of war. This happened before Abraham Lincoln came around to his position you know, on slavery. It was actually these Christian generals that took it on their own to do this thing and to do the right thing. And even uh, 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 after uh, emancipation and so forth, you know, and they had accepted the slaves, there was never really any hard-nosed policy about education. It was actually the Christian generals that decided to bring in the American Missionary Association to provide education to the slave. And there was a thirst for education. 
And the interesting thing to me about that too was uh, after they had conquered and they brought the uh, slaves to the schools, you didn't just have the little children, you had grown folks sitting down learning their ABCs too. This is the kind of story that we need to be telling our children. We need to be telling them what really happened. And when I say ancestral guilt, you need to teach them that they have an obligation to learn because this is what happened to our people. And okay, maybe you are great behind, but let's talk about what really happened. We had grown folks, you know, uh, sitting in the class with, you know, kindergarten and first graders going from the ground level. My uh, uh, great-grandfather, John Turner, he didn't get an education, he didn't start his education until he was 18 years old. And I found this, and this is the wonderful thing. You can find these stories now if you start searching in Google because Google has taken it upon themselves to get a whole lot of those unpublished documents put out there in the public domain and you can get out there and you can find these things. But anyway, I found him and his story because I have pictures and I've shared those pictures, mm -hmm. some of those pictures with you. But basically, he hadn't gotten his education, so he went to Payne College, a CME school over there in Augusta. And um, he, started, <laughs> he started with kids in first grade, finished that up, finished elementary school in two or three months, and went all the way to eventually earn a doctorate degree and became a uh, 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 esteemed preacher here in the Macon Middle Georgia area. The point I'm making is these folks here from Macon uh, have made these contributions, but our kids don't know it. Now getting back to uh, the American Missionary Association uh, and the Ballard Normal School. The Ballard Normal School was actually a seed bed for colored education, not only here in Macon, Georgia, but it was a seedbed for education for the entire United States. What we have lost in terms of not talking about our history is this. Outside of maybe Washington, D.C., and to some degree down in New Orleans, the place where the real activity went on around education was right here in Georgia. The American Missionary Association started uh, uh, Atlanta University, okay? And the kids that are going there now don't have a clue <laughs> that, that that ever occurred. Um, after the Civil War, they were responsible for about 80% of the education in Georgia. They work with the Freedmen's Bureau. Ballard uh, Normal began as Lewis High, and we are literally within what, two or three blocks from where it was because that school was right down here near the emergency room. And there is a little park that I would love for you all to film that's down there now. Hardly anybody in Macon knows anything about that little park that's sitting right there. But it's sitting right there. But anyway, it started off as Lewis High. Lewis High was named for John Lewis, who was, comes to find out, a dentist like myself who had he was a general who had lost his arm in the Civil War and worked for and probably with the Freedmen's Bureau and the American Missionary Association okay and the school started there and then the school uh, uh, moved e uh, eventually to uh, Pleasant Hill now it was renamed Ballard for uh, a gentleman who had made his money in the belting industry. The steam engines that were responsible for the industry of that period used these leather belts to turn different things. It could be farm equipment, it could be lathes, it could be anything and so forth. But that's what he had made his money on. So. General John Lewis, uh, with his consent, 
they renamed the school for a ballot, and that's how uh, the school became known as Ballot Norma. And then, see, Macon was a uh, shipping community. It was, it was really down on the waterfront. It was a waterfront community, and the cotton uh, and the town was located along the waterfront. The cotton would be sh shipped down to Savannah. So that, that school was located on the fringes of the town. See, these kids today don't even know that that's why there's so many African-American churches in downtown Macon. How did that happen? Well, they were on the fringes of the town, and the town grew towards them. And then, like I say, uh, 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 Ballot Normal moved from the site to Pleasant Hill, and that's where my father went to school, uh, uh, on Forest Avenue in Pleasant Hill. That's where the late Dr. Robert Williams went to school. Like I say, the American Missionary Association established most of the HBCUs in the United States. It is high time that we go back and revisit that history as a way to inspire our youth. Now, we've got all kinds of people that benefited from that seedbed, that school over there. John Oliver Killings, you know, started the Harlem Writers Guild in New York, and virtually nobody here in Macon, I'm talking about young folks particularly, and to be quite frank, most adults my age <laughs> don't know that to be a fact. But anyway, that's where he went to school there. Um, I was talking about uh, Dr. Braswell, I believe a relative of mine, because uh, we're all cousins. <laughs> But he was a Braswell. My uh, great-grandmother was a Braswell. He was the, we believe, the first college-trained dentist here in Macon. He went to that school. There's all kinds of folks that got this school. When I was in high school, the older people, I didn't know it at that time, but the older teachers that were actually teaching me were from Old Ballot Normal. That's where they came from. But again, I didn't know it at that time. Um, I just think we need to get back to uh, learning our history about our community. Uh, certainly, uh, we've got this issue all over the United States where the highways have come into our community and divided it and so forth. But along with that, pay, what I call paving over paradise, at least from a historical perspective, we've, got, we've lost our history. And it seems to me that if I'm supposed to be the educated elite, I'm supposed to be the old storyteller, what we call the griot. But if I don't know, how can I pass it on? Now, I could be sitting, enjoying my little cocktail, talking about how bad the children are, you know, how bad the music is, you know, and everything is a foul word and this, that, and the other. But the real question becomes this. What have we taught them? If you want them to have something positive to sing about, you better teach them their history so that they have somebody of substance, some mentors to sing about, so that they can craft the music, this hip hop music around something positive. What I'm hoping is in some small way to get a movement where we can flip this culture of non-academic achievement to something positive. And again, that's why our history is so important. The history of Pleasant Hill is not just important to uh, us Maconites, it's really important to the entire country because it is the entire country. What happened there literally was a seedbed that led to some positive things all over the United States and really the world and we have somehow lost that. And so I challenge, and the next thing I'm gonna be working on 
is I'm going to uh, uh, get involved with the Georgia Dental Society, the African American uh, organization, to tell them that they need to learn the history of their community where they practice. If they are the leaders, then they need to be the ones to stand up and learn the history and to be the griot to spread it around. Because if we don't do that, we are just spinning our wheels. But that's my, uh, I don't know, I guess that's my little soapbox. That's what I'm hoping I can make a contribution uh, to co my community. And I guess the bottom line is, um, <laughs> I'm hoping that may be my legacy. Uh, my goal is not to be able to get a $40,000 uh, Rolex watch, okay? Uh, I want to be able to be able to afford one of these cameras <laughs> that this young man's got here. But that's the kind of thing that I want to be able to contribute back to our community in terms of getting us back on track to realize the importance of our history. Can you tell me, now it was your grandfather that first came to Pleasant Hill? That was my great-grandfather. All right, your great-grand, is, is it the Turner grandfather, or? Uh, no, uh, he, we call him Paul Duval, uh, number one. We call him right. Old Paul. All right, before you start, mm -hmm. I would like you to talk about the Duvals coming to Pleasant Hill, where they lived, uh, could you talk just a little bit mm -hmm. more and the address downtown of the Apollo Street, you know, just some of the more okay. factual side of it, if you don't mind. But them coming to Pleasant Hill, why they came to Pleasant Hill, obviously somebody got married there, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to tell that, if you don't mind, sure. tell that personal story. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Duval, as we say, old Paul, Paul Duval number one. Um, lived on 3rd Avenue. Uh, he lived on 3rd Avenue in Pleasant Hill. Uh, he married uh, Tisha Braswell. That's the Braswell connection. They lived uh, on 3rd Avenue around Pursley and 3rd was the home house there, okay? Uh, I can remember stories about the fact that he used to ride a horse long after cars had been introduced. And um, the uh, Washington Avenue Presbyterian Church, that's an interesting story there too. Uh, that's where uh, the emancipation of the slaves was announced. But anyway, he, um, he had a hitching post there. And um, the short of it is uh, he would ride his horse to work and he'd ride at the church and so forth. And uh, again, he started the business. I think the business initially was located uh, on a different section of Cotton Avenue. It eventually uh, moved uh, uh, across the street from what's now called the Walton Building. And that's where I remember it growing up. <clears throat> um, he, um, again, wanted to provide an opportunity to educate his kids. And um, unfortunately, uh, he would also walk to work a lot of times. And apparently, he was walking to work and was uh, accidentally hit. And that's, that's how he lost his life. And that's how his son, uh, my grandfather, who I grew up with literally because I stayed with him for a while. I lived uh, on Middle Street and I had this little hustle that, uh, <laughs> that I would play. Um, my mother and father, William Duval, and uh, my mother, Thelma Duval, had gotten married during World War II. And um, my mother was at Spelman at the time, and my father was going off to war. He had finished school, so uh, they got married, and um, uh, 
I don't know, uh, about two, two or three years later, uh, I think she had the first child. But the short of it was, she was always planning to go back to school because that was the initial uh, thing that they had planned. But anyway, when I was coming up, my mother finally decided, you know, that uh, caning these chairs on the front porch. See, we used to be in the chair caning business too. I don't know if you know what chair caning is. Chair caning is this uh, reed material and there's these little octagon holes and it's very complicated because you have to go this way, then you have to go this way, then you have to weave this way, then you have to go diagonally this way, and then you have to go diagonally that way to do it. Very complicated. And I think she was getting something like, and there's holes in the chair, she's getting something like two cents a hole or anything. I think she came to the conclusion that life was uh, a more, uh, there was more to life than just came in those chairs, so she decided to go back to Fort Valley State College, which gets back to my point of my little hustle. So in the morning she would round us up, hurry us up to get ready to go to school, because we could walk up to school to L.H. Williams School. So we have a bowl of cereal and boom, she'd go out there and catch a ride with uh, her people going to Fort Valley State. And then uh, we would go off to school. Well, I would duck up 3rd Avenue. The shortest route was up 2nd <laughs> Avenue. But I would go up 3rd Avenue because I would stop by my grandmother's. And she would ask me what I had for breakfast. And I would tell her uh, I had a bowl of cereal. And she would say, oh, Tom, you just had a bowl. Well, let Grandma make you something. Let Momsy make you something good for breakfast. So I would sit down there. Lord, that's why I was overweight as a child. She would take this uh, strickling bacon, and she had a technique. You know, those, this was in the day when everybody had a big old can of Crisco on, on the stove, you know, all the drippings and so forth. I mean, today, nobody would do that. But you have all your drippings. You save all that good, as we call it, good grease in those days. But she would uh, take that strickling bacon there, and she would fry it. But this was a trick. There's a rind in there that's tough. You have to know to turn it on its side and let it cook a long time on the side because then it becomes crisp. Oh, I'd sit there, I have biscuits, eggs, you know, sausage, all this stuff. And then I'd go off to school. So this whole notion of get a nourishing breakfast, oh, I, I had one back in the day. So that was how I would go, go to school every morning. I'd stop off there and so forth. And then, of course, when my grandfather died, uh, I stayed with my grandmother. Uh, uh, you know, to keep her company and so forth, because she, she never remarried and so forth. And I guess that's just the way it was, you know, that, that's the way people perceive things back in the day and so forth. But that's where I spent, you know, my teenage years uh, then. And uh, uh, my grandmother gave me her old uh, 1950 Lincoln, and uh, to this day a lot of folks remember my old car. Because I think I was, uh, I don't know, I guess I was only one of very few kids in Macon that had a, a Lincoln that was driving a Lincoln <laughs> at that time. But anyway, um, my dad, he liked the idea because he knew I'd have to be out there caning those chairs to get gas for that thing because it had an old flathead V8 in it and it would burn gas. But anyway, the kids, uh, the way I would work it is uh, going off to Ballard Hudson See, back in the day, we had those school buses. And I think uh, uh, my good friend, Mr. Lightfoot, will vouch for this. They used to stack us in those school buses like sardines. These are old night World War II school buses. Uh, and I, I don't know, I think it was something like maybe a nickel or a dime, you know, and so forth. But we'd be stacked in there. So my, what I did was I got me a little group and I, we would drive off to school in my car and that's how I had gas from a car. So between, you know, working in my dad's shop and doing those things and my little hustle, you know, taking kids back and forth to school, that was how I was able to keep my car going and so forth. Um, but those are some of the things that, that I remember uh, growing up there uh, and, and that would, would be uh, sort of the history of where we were on uh, Middle St Street, the 300 block of Middle Street, um, which was down from what we called the branch at that time. Uh, 
which was really uh, Vineville, the branch was really Vineville Avenue and uh, Middle Street was really what we used to call the branch. Um, now, it was called, why was it called the branch? Well, <laughs> the reason for that was in back of our house, and of course it, it started down uh, near Vineville, uh, they had this uh, uh, um, huge pipe where the stream would go under Vineville, but see, back in those days, they didn't cover up streams in the African American community. Growing up, I actually remember, and my mother, she didn't believe it, but I remember when they paved Middle Street. But anyway, in back of our house was the branch, it was a little stream back there. And so that's why I believe we call that area the branch. And we weren't supposed to, but we played in that little branch back there. Um, and you can imagine uh, the water. <laughs> when it would rain, it was pretty good water, but sometimes <laughs> water back there was pretty rough. But we would play back there uh, in, in the branch and so forth. And, and uh, we made our own uh, fun. Uh, one, another thing I remember about Pleasant Hill, uh, and you should ask some other people about this, was when we were growing up, um, we had the, the biggest gift you could get was skates. And we literally had 300, about 300 kids skating all over Pleasant Hill. And then some people got upset and then the police came there in the community uh, to arrest us. And one of the things we used to talk about was how we ran away to get away from the police who was there to catch us for all of us skating in the street. Now, let's be honest, uh, there were a few things we shouldn't have been doing. I mean, you're not really supposed to hang on the back of a bus, you know, and have them pull you up the hill. But that's how you could get up the hill, you know, on your skates up Third Avenue. You just hang on the back of the bus and get your ride up, and then you could just glide on back down and so forth. But anyway, later on, like I said, we've always had a few good people. They got their act together and they blocked the street off. So First Avenue got to be blocked off for us to skate. And so we had our heroes that used to come down First Avenue. And uh, you had to really be in good shape. Now one of the things we, we learned to do, and because uh, uh, see we were ingenious at that time, but we knew how to recycle. We would take an old inner tube that was, you know, worn out, and we would cut it into these bands, and we would stretch them over the front of our skates. Because, see, these were the skates. See, OSHA wouldn't allow this today. They had these two little clamps that would clamp onto your shoes, and they were notorious for coming off. And they would come off at some bad times. So we would put those inner tubes over our feet. So when we'd get home, I'd look down at my feet, and it looked like I had gangrene because all the circulation in my toes would be gone from putting that band on our foot. But you needed to do that because uh, a few kids came down First Avenue and you had to have some guts come down that hill. And when they got there where the branch was, there was a crease in the street and some of them, uh, the skate got caught and they ended up flipping over into the branch and so forth. But that was all part of the fun and so forth. Uh, uh, it was just part of growing up and it was just the things we, we, we learned to enjoy and, and endure and so forth. And so I have a whole lot of fond memories of uh, growing up, you know. And I think a pair of J.C. Higgins skates was the Rolls Royce of the skates in those days. I'd love to see a pair of those now. But that was what we all aspired to have back then. Um, but. I don't know, I don't think we captured a lot of that. I have never seen any picture of the hordes of kids, you know, on skates. Well, that gives me something to look for. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Duvall, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, for the, thank for you. The wide breadth of stuff that you were sharing with us. And it looks like Mr. Lightfoot is here. Yes. I think, oh, you saw him. Yeah, I saw him <laughs> coming in. <laughs> And he's going to give you the rest of the story. <laughs>